here coming to you from Zoomlandia, my, my now favorite land, because it helps me to reach out to people who I can't travel to right now. And today is no exception. Please introduce yourself. Hello, I am Taylor Earl. I am the owner and dyer of Fiber for the People Yarn and the host of the Fiber for the People Presents YouTube channel here on YouTube. And I love that we're coordinating. I've got a little mustard shoulder for you. I was, I was noticing that. I would, yeah, I noticed that immediately. <laughs> It's so funny. It actually happens more often than I expect. Like sometimes I'm just sort of holding my guest in my heart a little bit and I get dressed that way. And then more often than not, we're almost matching. Yeah, it works out. It's weird. So I love your lip, your lip color too, by the way. <laughs> lip beyond point. Well, you know, because of the masks, I'm always like when I'm home, I'm like, yeah, I'm putting it on. No, that's actually what this is. I have it with me right now too. So it's just, it's ready to go. So tell me your fiber story. Wow. Okay. So I knew you were going to ask this question. I'm like, what is my fiber story? What can I say? Um, it started in 2009. My husband, who was actually my fiance at the time, got me this like knitting kit. It was like a Slurpee cup, you know, the Slurpee cups with the dome lids. So it was a Slurpee cup and in the hole were the knitting needles and in the cup was the like yarn. And it taught, it was just some kind of like acrylic multicolored yarn and it came with a little pamphlet that taught you how to knit and that was kind of what launched like the hobby and then so it was kind of always just like you know, sitting on the couch not doing a whole lot knitting it was a hobby and then my um I was I became pregnant with my first and that was back in 2014 I was a teacher before what I'm doing now I was a teacher for eight years so I realized that I was going to leave teaching to be home with my son and during that time of kind of like being home with him and not having work, I really like kind of dove into like knitting, like took a real deep dive into that because I needed something to fill my time. And then that kind of one thing led to another. It led to a knitting podcast because I saw other people doing knitting podcasts and I was thinking like, I could do this. Like I could talk about knitting for an hour, if not more. And then that led to exploring hand dyed yarn, which got me into trying hand dyed yarn as like literally just a hobby at that time and I think the, the artistry of that and the color and all of that really I don't know just lit it up for me and so that was what turned into what this is and this has become more of like a pat I mean knitting is still something I love to do but this is like my passion so that's kind of quick and dirty how I got to this point. Why did your husband feel compelled to give you this this hobby kit because that's a real that's a real presumption. Like when people gift you art or when they gift you, you know, here, make this thing, right? You know, I had, yeah. So <laughs> when I was in college, I had a friend who I went to her house one day and she had some college age. She had a basket and it had like yarn and knitting projects like going. And I thought it was like the coolest kind of strangest hobby for this person to be doing like I was like okay this is cool like and when I was at her house she was having like a gathering like a college social gathering so there's gonna be people there whatever you can imagine and like you have your like knitting out I think that's amazing and so I think from that point on it was like whatever that was that she was doing like I wanted to do that because it was so different and kind of like I don't know unusual for a person of college age I guess to do that or at least I thought that whatever but now it's totally different now I just think it's like so normal but I remember saying to my husband I was like you know so and so had this basket of yarn and I thought it was just super cool and kind of different and I want to do that like whatever that is I just want to try what that was and I at the time I didn't know if it was knitting or crochet um so he just I don't know he just clutched onto that and we were in Laguna Beach and we were walking down and there was like a shop that had a bunch of novelty stuff and he just went in and got it and gave it to me for Christmas so that's so cool. Okay. We've changed locations because of the, the Nevada sun. Yeah. And actually, I'm kind of glad you did because this is a different little pocket of your office. And we'll get to your office in a second. But yeah, I loved hearing you talk about how, you know, we have this perception or sort of stereotype of who knits and like what knitting is. And so I kind of love that your first, you know, inkling to try it was in the setting of young people. Yeah. Really cool. Which 
it's funny because I think that was what intrigued me the most about it. I think that was one of the things that kind of really caught my, it was because I knew that she was, I mean, I don't, I don't know, I can't remember how old we were, but you know, she was in her early twenties and I'm thinking like, it wasn't so much that, oh, it's so cool. She's young. Like she shouldn't be knitting. It was more just like, like, why not take on something like this? Why not start this? Because you don't see it happening very often. Like, I think that because it was such a novelty to me, I was like, okay, then maybe I need to try this because, Mm -hmm. you know, it obviously isn't as much of a novelty as I think it is. And now when you're part of this knitting community, clearly it's everywhere, which is amazing. So yeah, I don't know. I kind of feel silly that that was my, my thought, but it was. (laughs) When I see people knitting, I automatically feel like I'm part of something more and like, we don't have to explain it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I guess maybe I was that person though, who would have put her in that position that she had to like explain that to me, which kind of makes me feel bad, but I don't know if I approached it like that. It was more just like, maybe I didn't want to let on like, Oh, what is that? It was like, Oh, you're knitting. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, but we but, yeah. like it when people ask us, right? I mean, I love it. Yeah. I love it. And I liked the, the look on their face when they're like, Oh, like, I kind of like that because it opens like a conversation, I guess. So yeah, for sure. So, so I think it's really interesting that the podcast came before the dying because a lot of dyers, they start a podcast to build up their business. So can you talk about sort of the oh. metamorphosis of that? Yes. Um, okay. So y- you know what it's like to be an at-home mom. I'm not sure. If, yeah. I I, from what I know, you know what it's like. Yeah. So when my first was born into this world, it was a beautiful thing, but I kind of knew, like we wanted to have children, but I knew like, this is going to be a challenge for me. I'm very independent. Like I, I like to do the things I like to do. Like you get this. Um, so when he was here and you kind of lose all of that, you start to kind of lose your identity a little bit and you become just this person to provide for this other small, tiny person. And um, that was really taking its toll on me. I was just like, I need to have something back. Like before this, I was, you know, a fourth grade teacher and I, that was my thing. And I knit on the side and then I could do whatever else I wanted to do. Like, and so I decided to pick up the needles and really start knitting again. And then it was like really late at night. I think I was, um, I can't even remember if it was like a feeding schedule situation, but I was up really late watching YouTube. And I was like, knitting, (laughs) what can I, what's out there, you know, and that's where I discovered like podcasts. And I think the first podcast that I watched that really kind of like opened my eyes to what this was, was the Yarngasm podcast, which is the Volenvine podcast. Um, And then it was like, you know, like Brooklyn Knit Folk and those, you know, I was just like, oh, okay, so these girls are just sitting here talking about knitting. Like if I had somebody hanging out with me, I could do that. (laughs) So I was thinking that maybe this is a really cool opportunity to like branch out and create like an identity for myself. And so that's, that's what started that was the, almost just that need for that to have, you know, people to chat about something that I loved who shared a common like bond, I guess. I don't know. So yeah, that's why that came about first. And then the dying thing, I think hand dyed yarn to me was still new. Like I, I wasn't like super familiar with it at the time. And then when I discovered what it was through these knitting podcasts, like, oh, that's like amazing yarn. Like, look at those colors. Um, I thought that, well, you know, I should just give it a shot. Like, because I see that other people are doing it. There weren't, you know, at that time. And even now you're hard pressed to find channels that talk about dyeing yarn. It's just like, here's dyed yarn and I knit with this and that. And so there weren't a whole lot of like routes to go to like learn how to do it. But um, I could like research online, figure out what I needed. And I just got started that way. So that was, I think, another way, another facet of this new identity I was creating for myself. And it, and it became something like huge for me. So, yeah. Well, I was just thinking, I hadn't thought of this before because I started my channel in a similar space as you. My children were much older at the time. And for me, it was more about kind of bridging the gap because the acting jobs had sort of dried up. Um, There's definitely this sweet spot. And I remember when I was in my early 20s, people would tell me, we lose the women around their 30s. And it's because they make different life choices or 
you know, whatever. There's all, there's all yeah. sorts of reasons. And, and I was thinking, well, I, I'm getting lost because you're not booking me anymore. You're booking the girls in their 20s to play the parts that are actually age appropriate for me now. Right. And I did that to the other ladies when I was 24. You know, like <laughs> one of the last uh, print jobs I booked, I think I was 27 or 28. And I was paired with a man who was, you know, passing as like, I would say late forties, maybe 50 as my husband. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter was 18 and I was 28. So all of that just sort of happens over and over again in this business. Yeah. I mean, we've heard this before. And so I needed a creative outlet and, and, but I hadn't thought before about it really helping in those early years when you're right. You're just, you feel like if you're nursing, you feel like a food machine. If you're not, mm -hmm. you know, you have mm -hmm. to make macaroni and cheese appear, you know, yeah, yeah. In a moment's notice. So yeah, <laughs> I, I love that. And, and, you know, it is a big sacrifice to give up your career to stay home with the kids. So it is nice mm -hmm. that you can have this outlet. And I love that it led you to dying. I heard that it is hard to find the trade secrets about dying. So where did you go for your sources? Mm. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, you know, I saw there was like a few like vlog style videos um, that various different dyers were putting out at the time. And I don't know if those people still have them out. Um, I mean, I guess if they were published on YouTube, I can tell you. But oh, like, I know- Great secrets, you don't have to. No, 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 I'm not gonna. Uh, the, I think that Vullenvine had a couple of like vlog style videos. And it wasn't like, see when I, um, and I get asked this question, rather often like how do you get this on your yarn like how do you make it look like this like how do you what do you use to oh gosh this question all the time what do you use to make speckles like that kind of thing you get asked all the time and when I was getting into this like I didn't I wouldn't have had the gumption to ask anybody questions because I would have been afraid <laughs> so the fact that these people are willing to ask me I'm like hey like more power to you but um I didn't ask any questions I just kind of skimmed through like what does yarn dyeing look like what tools do I need what like setup do I need and that was kind of more what I did when I did my research it was it was more about like the technical part of it and less about the artist like artistry part of it um and so that's kind of all I really gleaned from the internet and then like of course if you go to like Dharma Trading Company where they sell the dye like they can talk to you about like the the chemical process in it and so you you knew what kind of um chemical not chemicals but like you know certain things that you need um well it's I mean, the ingredients yeah thank you <laughs> it makes it sound really sketchy when you're like, what kind of chemicals i needed <laughs> but yeah so that was kind of where that came and then once i had all of that stuff together like the pans and the citric acid and like the dye and then of course the yarn um then that was where i just kind of started messing around with stuff and this is before the idea of turning this into a business came about i um at this point it was just like oh this is look at this other hobby i do husband you know? <laughs> it's not so expensive that was, at all no <laughs> and it's not going to become anything don't worry no so like that was kind of just like exploring with color and that um so i don't have an art background technically but that was where i really discovered like color like I always have loved color but like putting them together and figuring what really goes well together and like learning color theory all on my own like that was um, that was where all that kind of started and so it transformed me into this person who is very like kind of art centric like everything is like design and color it, like becomes a big part of it. like your shirt for example it was like <laughs> this sounds so ridiculous but it was like the first thing I noticed was like that is an amazing shirt and it's obviously would be a yarn topped with black speckles <laughs> let's make a skein of yarn for my shirt yes send me like a proper picture and i will <laughs> it's beautiful well, yeah i was sure. just i was just gonna ask you that you answered the question which was you know what's your art background because you mentioned you're a fourth grade teacher you know before yeah. this i mean if you could have tapped yourself on the shoulder back, you know, when you were doing your student teaching and said, actually, in about 10 years, you're going to be a professional yarn dyer. Ah, if only, you know, so um, I, I have thought about this before, because this, like, there's times where I, like, so my husband's a teacher, he teaches high school, and um, 
I will talk about stuff and he'll like about the, the teaching and all of that. And I feel so um, kind of departed from that part of my life, like, which is kind of bizarre because you think like that was a huge part of my life for, I mean, I went to college for that. I did it for almost nine years, you know, whatever. But now it just feels like, wow, yeah, there was this time that I got into teaching, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, but um, it was a very challenging time. Teaching is incredibly difficult. I, I enjoyed it and I was good at it, but um, if I had known then what I know now, God, I don't know. I almost wonder if I would have just like, you know, hightailed it out of there and gotten an early start. <laughs> but I think I truly believe that, um, that everything that led up to the moment when my son was born and because, because yarn dyeing as a business definitely was born out of like wanting to work again, like wanting to have, make a living. And I was blessed to be able to do it out of something that was like, a, a, like a love, you know, and not just like a, I just need to go grind and make money kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, gosh, I don't even know. I guess, I guess it's hard to say because I do believe that like all of those years like needed to happen to make this as special as it is. So I do think you know, I've gone through some life changes too recently with just my daughter going off to college. That's a big moment. I mean, just a tip. Don't listen to the song Landslide. It's just, it's pretty oh, rough. I already know this song. I'm, yeah. Pretty rough. And so just those, those big life changes, you know, my perspective has been shifting lately and thinking, you know, when you talk to sort of a much older person, like 80s, and if they are still, if they're still with it enough to talk about their past lives, or if you look at a picture of them when they're young and you, you're, you just kind of marvel at, wow, this life you led and all these different eras and chapters and, and you can't, but at the time you can't really understand that you also will go through that. Yeah. So if we had, if we knew the end at the beginning, we wouldn't have this life that we have. So I, I think it's right. really cool that you had an opportunity to teach. Do you want to give us a little PSA for the teachers right now, because I think that's the hardest job right now during COVID. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, um, gosh, so my son is in kindergarten, so I see his teacher, um, and everything. And the, I think the biggest advice I would give to teachers understanding what it's like to teach even live and in person is to just be good to yourself and to know that anything that you are doing for these students right now and and their families like anything you're doing is an amazing thing and you're providing them with much more than they would have you know if if we weren't able to have teachers face to face with kids at all but like but truly like I say this to my husband like listen like if you're there and you're putting in your best and your heart into what you're doing it's it's amazing so any of those teachers out there that are you know putting something out there for these students like you're doing amazing things and even on those days when you feel like it has all gone to like to hell essentially it is still amazing so that's i think that was like advice for teachers like i would give teachers in any situation it's like if you're showing up and putting in your heart and your best work like you're doing more than you could possibly imagine and i have so much respect for all of these teachers dealing with this right now because i know god <laughs> like how frustrating it must be so it, it yeah. must feel like a bait and switch because they were yeah. like, well, I signed up for this profession, not what it looks like right now. Yeah. Or imagine teachers that have been doing it for so many years. They're, you know, they're close to retirement and this is what they're having being asked to do. And it's like, what at that point, like, what do you do? <laughs> I mean, this is a whole different, this, there's a huge generational gap in terms of like what they're able to understand technologically. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, and that's understandable. I mean, you have to imagine, I, I know my husband at his school, he's already had staff just retire because they can't. They're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's no shame in that. Like, no. can you blame them? <laughs> like, yeah, like go. You know, just, I, yeah. My daughter went to a Waldorf school. One of my daughters did for a little while. And I just keep thinking, what in the world are they doing? If you know anything about Waldorf, they're screen free. I'm from, somewhat familiar. Yeah. Media free. And I just think, what in the world are they doing? <laughs> are they, what are they doing? I don't know. Are they doing distance education? <laughs> I can't even imagine how they would oh. begin, you know? Yeah. Anyways, well, I just, my, good. Yeah. 
no, go ahead. I was just saying my heart goes out to the parents of special needs students. Like I can't even imagine. It's a whole yeah. other. It's so hands-on with them. Yeah. Sure. So let's talk about, so do you still do the podcast at the same regularity as you did when it started? No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so when I started the podcast, again, like I had one little one, he was very little and um, my business wasn't what it is today. And I had a lot more time. <laughs> and so it was, I like once every two weeks, you know, podcasts. And then in between that, I would do like little, you know, like vlog videos. And it was, it was great, but like now I have another little one who's two, yeah. So I have two little boys. I have this growing business that takes up, I mean, it's a legit operation during the day. Um, so, and then also with like the school from home deal and everything, it's been really hard for me to keep that every two week schedule. <laughs> like I, it's, I laugh at that idea. Um, so yeah, my like consistency and when I upload onto the channel has been kind of, especially in the last six months, because we bought a house and moved in June and, you know, pandemics and moving and all of that. Yeah. Um, so, so that's been making it a little bit more difficult, but moving forward now that we're kind of settled, I'm going to try and do like a once monthly with maybe some things scattered in, but yeah, life definitely impacts that as I know you're aware because you are, you're so regular on your videos. So but this is your, this yeah. is your thing. So yeah, I'm not dying cool. yarn. Uh, you have, yeah. <laughs> you have quite an operation. So I want to talk about sort of your setup because you did move. Did, was the move partly because of the business? Yeah. Well, yeah, it was, um, it was also, we just needed more space. I think like, yeah, we just needed a bigger house and the one that we were living in before was, it was cute, but it was, it was small. And then of course, yeah, definitely we needed something um, where I could have like an office and then also my workspace in our house before. Yeah. I didn't have a dedicated office like room. Like I have now, it was just like part of our bedroom. Um, and we used the garage for my dining space, but it was just not what it is now. And so when we moved, it was definitely more for like the size of our house and, uh, for our family and everything, but with the business, obviously with the business in mind. So the garage that I have now and the way that we have it set up, it's, yeah, it's like a huge, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> It looks so you... organized, all your little bottles on the shelves and all the pans. Yeah. Yeah. It's, those are all my, what is it? My, um, my dad always says it looks like a, uh, like a laboratory with like all the, chem he says chemicals. Like, dad, they're not chemicals. <laughs> yeah. So talk about your customers. <laughs> oh, my customers. I love my customers. And it's not even just my customers. It's anybody who, you know, cause Instagram is where the business kind of is founded, uh, you know, it, the foundation is there and um, the people that are supporting the business and everything. I just, I love them because they have such an appreciation for what I'm doing. And they, um, you know, how you can say like somebody like gets your work, like they get it, like they understand why you did what you did. And I think that the people that come and support my business, whether it's just on Instagram or whether they actually make purchases, like they get what I'm doing. And I feel like I love them so much for that because I put so much heart and thought into like all of these things that I'm like all the yarn that I'm dying and these colors and all of that. And so I say my customers are amazing because they like, they appreciate what I'm doing wholeheartedly and they totally get like the inspiration. Um, yeah. And they're, and they're there to watch it all happen. And in a lot of different ca like capacities, like whether they're just a viewer, whether they're a dyer themselves that are trying to gather inspiration, whether they're just yarn connoisseurs or stashers or whatever, like stashers. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, trust me. I, there's a lot of stashers that will come around and they tell me, you know, cause they'll tell me their little like stash secrets where they put it when it comes or whatever. I think it's awesome. And, um, yeah, but that's, I think what I love about my customers is they totally appreciate the work and that's cool. When did the photos start changing to, or were they always, cause I thought there was a shift when you had yeah. this like dark, I don't know if it's Navy or like a charcoal background. It's like a dark matte black. Yes. Yeah. So when did that start? I feel like I noticed a shift in the aesthetic of the photographs. Was that a thing? Yeah. Oh, definitely. I, um, so when was that? Two years ago was the last time I used a white background. So I went from, and I, I don't know how far back you've gone, but so I went from like 
a white background, but it was like wood slats because that was like all the rage. And it was when I was first starting out on Instagram, white washed wood. Um, and then from there, I remember it was like natural wood and like props. Yeah. Like right? little flower and a yeah. sticker. <laughs> yeah. All sorts of, I almost said like a bad word, like all sorts of stuff <laughs> all over the place. Um, and then like, I was like, okay, like this is pretty. And I guess if it's like fall, like it's, visually inspiring but it's less about the yarn and more about just this like like the gourd see yes it's about the gourd <laughs> and how inspiring is a gourd no matter how pretty the yarn is next to every place and so I was like I can't do this prop thing the prop thing is that's not for me and then I think that was where I was like okay nothing it's just white <laughs> and so I got like this really cool it was just white background and I started doing that and it was really cool I liked it I liked the white I I thought it was pretty and it was like uh, bright. And I know that a lot of times when we're on Instagram looking at pictures, we tend to focus on the bright things. They catch our eye, obviously. Um, and that lasted for a long time. But then something that I started noticing was that my colorways aren't, they're not, well, I mean, sometimes they are, but they're not typically light and speckled, like barely their colorways. They're bold and they have like, um, depth and dimension and all of that and I felt like the white background didn't serve them very well because it kind of washed out the whole image because that's exactly what it does uh, it captures that light and pushes it back to the camera and I was like this is pretty but it's not working for everything that I'm doing and then it turned into like it's not working for most of the things that I'm doing so I wanted to do something oh and then another thing too is like you see it everywhere like you see just the plain white background under the yarn like you see that and so I decided I wanted to try something different. Yeah, so then it was, I was taking a photo before I switched to the black background. I was taking a photo and I had my auto um, shutter going and I was like positioning all the yarn and my, the shutter went off before I could pull my hands away. And then my hands were like stuck in the photo and I'm like, hmm, I kind of like that. Like, I'm not going to use props, but like my hands, you know, they don't count. Like that's totally different. And so that was where the hand thing started to come from. Um, I loved the like interaction between like a physical person and like the yarn. Um, I also kind of liked how you could see the, the skin tone and the yarn because it kind of gave you a, a reference for like the color, like the brightness. Um, and so that was, that was good with that. And then I kind of started to think like I want something moodier. I want to evoke something a little bit more like deep and dimensional. And so that's when I popped in the black background just to give it a shot one day. And it's the black background, it's matte, so it doesn't have any shine. And I take the photos next to a north facing window and that's the key. Yeah, um, it just, it was amazing. The first time I did it, my hands were in the shot and I was like, this is, this is incredible. And you, you don't see that. Like at that time, I think I've seen it pop in a little bit more. I've seen folks like use a black background, but before like, I never saw it. And I'm like, this is so cool. Like I'm gonna do this because I think it really, serves the yarn it kind of gives you this cool like moody aesthetic which captures like the imagination and so yeah I fell in love with it from there on and 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 even after the black background came into play there's been a little bit of an evolution um the distance from the camera like uh not necessarily angles it's mostly flat lay but it's kind of evolved and it's fun to look back at that so have you noticed that your business has grown because of the change in the photographs <laughs> You know, I, I noticed when I first made the change, um, I noticed that there was a jump in like, okay, so this is an interesting thing too. There was a jump in new business, but there was an, also a jump in male attention. So like, you know how on Instagram you can graph your audience? I love that you can do that because I can see like where people are coming from, but I can see like how many are men and how many are women or at least who's like chosen to identify like that on Instagram. And like, so I noticed that I'm getting more of the, the men following. And I wondered at that time. So this was at that time. I was like, whoa, like I just got a huge uptick. If it had something to do with like, maybe like there's like a neutrality to the black background, or maybe it does provide a masculine edge. Like who knows? Like, but I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then after that, like it started to, I think the background and the aesthetic started to match the yarn and that really started to capture both my imagination, but also potential followers. 
And I think because I was just so connected to that way more than I was to everything else that came out in like my posts and my writing, like in the way that I styled the photos. So maybe that contributed to like, you know, new followers. And I feel like um, I've kept it up since then. I have, you know, cause I just love it. I love the way it looks and it really captures like what this sounds silly, but like my brand, I guess, for Fiber for the People. And I think that will kind of create like a faithful following as well. Do you mind so. if I share some of the photos on here so people know what we're no, talking about? Yeah, not at all. What, why did you come up with Fiber for the People? What was that title about? Um, that was like one of those other late nights sitting in front of a computer, like trying to come up with a name. Cause like I had this idea for the business at this point, like I knew it was going to be a thing. And uh, I was just thinking, okay, I've got to come up with some kind of name. And I, um, I thought like I wanted something, <sighs> I wanted something that had both elements in the name so like obviously yarn and I didn't want it to say yarn that was like a thing though I was like, I, I want to keep I want to keep yarn out of it because that is very commonly used and like obviously it's yarn but I wanted it to be more of a play on not just like the physical thing that I'm selling but like substance like this is substance like a thing it's like fiber is like like the substance of our lives I don't know something weird but then I just thought like fiber and who is this for? Like, what am I, who am I doing this for? It's like, and I want to bring this to people. I want all people. I want to create yarn that like people in general can appreciate. And then I remember thinking like, uh, like propaganda <laughs> names, like fiber for the people, like, which sounds really bad, but like, that's kind of, it comes off like that. Um, and I, I said it out loud or I wrote it down in a piece of paper and I'm like, yeah, like, I think this will do. <laughs> and it was, that was like my reaction. It was like, I think this will do. It wasn't like, oh, this is, this is it. This is going to blow them all out of the water. It was like, this will do. <laughs> and then that, that was it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I think it's so fascinating that, that you've gotten more male viewership. I'm going to look at your photos yeah. one more time. Because I, well, I mean, I'll say it. I feel like, I, under, I think it's interesting how you pointed out the neutrality of it, but I do think the hands, I think the hands are sexy. Thank you. <laughs> you know, they, you. There's, there's an unexpected gut reaction to it, I think, because mm -hmm. you're thinking, oh, I'm looking at yarn and knitting. And then suddenly there's this, like, like you said, so when I work in the business, especially with children, um, one of my side hustles is I'm a baby wrangler. And so I'm the, the, it's almost like a photo assistant. So I work very closely with the photographer and we're shooting mm -hmm. children. Um, mm -hmm. We're not shooting them with guns. We're shooting them with cameras. <laughs> Gotcha. And so a lot of brands, uh, and I feel fine saying them, J. Crew kind of started it, Crew Cuts, sort of mm -hmm. started this idea of the in-between moments shot. And so if you've studied, if you've done any studying of children's photography over the years, you'll notice um, like a kid like pulling their hat or they're like itching their eye or there's just this mm -hmm. like kind of moment in between or they're like, they're fixing, like this is the shot instead of the or whatever yeah. it was, you know, in the 80s yeah. and 90s. It's not, it's now mm -hmm. all about sort of this, these shapes. And I was actually just in Target the other day with my mask on doing some socially distant shopping. And I was checking yeah. out the photographs and I recognized several of the models and I've worked for Target also. And, and they're just sort of adopting this whole in-between moments, like photography, especially for children now. So I, I feel like there's something to that with this and, and just the story you told of how it came to be. It was this unintentional grab of your hand. Yeah. And now I love the way that you call them in between moments. That's perfect. Yeah. Because if I'm just looking at this one, I'll just pop it up. This is mm -hmm. almost like it's, and, and I'm, I'm fascinated that you can take your own photos and get both of your hands in the shot. It's amazing. And time, <laughs> the time, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's like, it's like, you're getting it ready. You know, it's like you're propping it to get it ready and then you're going to take it. So I, I think it's brilliant. Thank you. That photo that you're looking at right there is actually, that's not the one, but that's what I'm, what I'm doing there with my hands is exactly what I was doing in the photo that caused me to like, they were just pushing them out under the camera. Um, and yeah, that's, and it's funny because like what you say about J. Crew, I completely know what you're talking about because I used to be a J. Crew magazine's like catalog subscriber, love J. Crew. And I loved, and I think it was because they used to have these really awesome like places they take their photos but that was one of the things I loved about their photos was like that the models were doing something and it wasn't like like you said it wasn't like they were posing they were just doing something and 
And I like that. I've always been kind of intrigued by that. And my dad used to always tell me to like, whenever you're going to take a picture of a person, try to capture a picture of them, like in a moment, not just like standing in front of the camera. Cause you could take that person and superimpose them anywhere. But if they're in a moment, like it's different. So that's like, I don't know kind of where my brain was at too. And so when you sit in between moments, it's exactly what it is. And so as after I started realizing, okay, I'm going to make my hands like a character in my photos, it's connecting the yarn to a person, meaning like there's like this tactile element to loving yarn. Like, as we all know, it's, it's an experience um, from the smell to what it looks like to the feel, all of that. And then obviously to working with it. But that to have my hands in the shot really kind of sends home that idea that this is like a tactile experience and there's people involved in this. And they, I started getting into like where I would be, like there'd be, there's a photo in there of me like about to unskein a blue skein of yarn. I'm like beginning to untwist it. And you know, you just start, how, how many ways can I interact with the yarn? I think I found the photo you were talking about, which is, it'll be really dark here, but I'll superimpose the correct one. Is it this one? that's it's not the one but that's another one too where it's like laying over my hands and holding it I'll, I can even send it to you um but it's one of my favorites because it kind of is like like you're about to like undo something or something kind of like you know yeah sensual it is sensual I mean the word sensual is about the senses yes yes Yes, absolutely. And it's provocative. And I think that's what I love about what you're, what you're doing with these photos. We only have a few minutes left. Do you want to show us anything? Do you have any show and tell nearby or should we just send people to your website? Yeah, send them to the site, send them to the Instagram. That's, I mean, Instagram is the best place to go. I have a few skeins here that I have to get twisted up, but yeah, I think you can see everything over on those places. And how uh, do you shop? Yeah, do you I, updates? Yes. So my, I have, so I really do encourage people to go to the shop site. If there's nothing like in stock at the moment, which is the case at the moment, there's a lot there to learn about. Um, I encourage people to check into like what my lucky strikes are, that there is a frequently asked question section or uh, an about section. And there is a spot there, a page for about my shop format that lets people know like how to purchase for me. I have a sweater quantity option and then I have my shop update. But my shop updates are every two weeks typically. Um, I do two colorways per shop update. And um, anything that a person can't grab in a shop update, they can purchase through sweater quantities, so they can check that out. Um, and then also my email, there's a contact on there if anybody has any questions about how to purchase from me. But I am, um, everything that I sell, I sell exclusively from my site. My site. I don't um, wholesale out, so that's the only place that you can purchase it. Uh, so definitely look into like how to go about doing that. But in terms of seeing what I'm doing, um, Instagram, and then here on YouTube, Fiber for the People Presents, you can watch lots of vlog videos of, of me dyeing yarn, so there's all of that. Oh, and I sent, I sent you some goodies too, by the way, so people you can talk about that. <laughs> One last question before you go, Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. Have you found that work-life mom balance thing? Because I know, especially during Corona, when people are working from home, like, do you have any, like, mm -hmm. lesson, le life lessons you've learned or that you would tell other people or, you know, what comes to mind? Yes. Um, so have I found that balance? I am feeling like I'm always on the journey to find that perfect balance, but I feel like I'm finding things that help me strike it. And a big part of that, and especially for anybody who's like venturing into any kind of a creative business is to number one, always remember why you started that business in the first place. And number two, do not work outside of your capacity because like, don't explode your, don't try to like explode your business. Don't try to do all of those things because you're inevitably going to work beyond your capacity and that leads to burnout. And I think one of the biggest things that I've always kept, that's, that's always in the forefront of my mind and keeping that there and knowing like, this is my capacity as a mother, as part-time homeschooler, <laughs> like this is what I can do. And so I'm always thinking that way, but little things to kind of like, I've gotten into um, guided meditation lately, like where you like, listen, they just, it's pretty much like they tell you like bedtime stories. It's not what it is. It's much more sophisticated than that. But like, I think I do like the Calm app and there's like celebrities mm -hmm. that will tell you these like, and it's great. And it kind of like, it totally relaxes you. Um, I do yoga occasionally and, and I don't put these things on a calendar like Tuesdays and Thursdays. I do yoga and Wednesdays or whatever. I just, I do them when I have an available moment. I use it for myself. And, and that's, I would say that going forward that's what i've got so far it's like when you've got those available moments find time to just relax and do something for yourself and i think in that process we'll eventually gather our balance but it's definitely a work in progress all the time but 
Love that. Well, I loved talking to you today and I hope that you get some new members. Yeah, me too. And yes, thank you so much for spreading the word. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. so much fun. So thank you. And I guess we'll say goodbye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Moments after our interview ended, I got a package and Taylor sent me some skeins. So I've got this gorgeous called kick drum and it's bulky and she's put the date on it 8 2020 isn't it gorgeous so beautiful look at that so beautiful so thank you so much for this gorgeous yarn i love it so much and if you're a patron there is a discount code for you so head on over to our blog and you can get a discount on fiber for the people if you're one of my patrons and if you'd like to be a patron you can go to patreon.com slash christyglassknits and sign up we have knit nights we have secret videos we have discount codes we have early access to things i'm involved with and um it's a really good time this is gorgeous so gorgeous <laughs>